Hi everyone, it's Andy from Hobby Headquarters. Well, I've got an exciting new build for you guys today. Today we're going to be building up the 16 scale TACOM Panzer 1B. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce that right now. Not without uh, a cue card in front of me. But basically this is the stretch version of the Panzer 1A. The one that I built eh, probably about a year and a half ago now. And it also has this uh, contraption on the back here that would uh, put explosives at, uh, at bunkers. So they would back this thing up. It would drop somehow the explosives in there. I don't know if it ever actually got used. Um, please, if you know, because uh, it, it started off like I think in the 30s when they were experimenting with this. So if you know if they actually use this, please go ahead and put a comment down below in there because I didn't actually see anything that said it, it really got used. But it's cool looking. Now, the original one, the A version, I did in North Africa. So I thought, I want to do a German gray one now. So as what you've seen probably by the little, little section in the front of this video that we did paint it in German gray. And it's a beautiful kit. I love these 16 scales. They are full of detail, and, but not a ton of parts. And that way you can spend a little bit of time having fun building it, but a lot of time weathering and painting and you know doing all the artistic stuff inside of that, which is my favorite part of the entire build. So uh, the video is going to be a little bit longer because we're going to do a little bit more in depth of the actual what we did to achieve like the effects for the painting and weathering and things like that but had a lot of fun doing this kit and I would highly recommend that if you're looking for something different in the sense that because it's so much bigger parts it's a little bit more uh, not so tedious as I guess is the best way to do sometimes with the 35th scale kits you know when they have a lot of parts they kinda you know ah, that's a lot of stuff to do for such a small kit this is just the opposite big and detail so I, I guess I've spoken enough on that right there. So, uh, real quick also too, uh, I know I haven't been doing a lot of videos. The, the warehouse has been a lot, a lot of work down here. It's coming along. Our racks finally arrived. I will be doing a video probably next week to show you uh, inside in there as we get more and more product in there. It's coming along great. A uh, lot, a lot of work though, as you can imagine. So, let's get started. And now we can start building the, the new TACOM 116 scale Panzer 1B, the Obwerf for Richton version. And basically what this version is right here, this is the, the exact same kit of the Panzer 1B that they came out with fairly recently, but with this boom down on the top here. And what this is, is an explosive charge inside of here that they designed this, that the, the vehicle would back into like a bunker lower this down at the the base of the bunker scoot away real fast and explode it and I was looking at it it's it's so different and new I thought I'd want to build this one up the the majority of the build is going to be the same for the the regular Panzer 1B and you may remember me building up the Panzer 1A now the main difference between the two vehicles is going to be the number of road wheels and how long the vehicle is. If you notice on the bottom one there, there are four road wheels and the B, the one we're going to start building today, has five. So subsequently they had to stretch the chassis out a little bit there. I had an absolute blast building this one. The tracks, every bit about this kit was incredible and when the, the B version came out I said definitely have to build that one. So let's get started on that right now. We're going to start off with the uh, the bathtub style hull that is included with it. And also I made a comment earlier saying the main difference is the, you know, the stretch chassis and the extra road wheel. There are a few other uh, differences like on the rear of the, the vehicle with the way the muffler system is set up and stuff. And that was because the engine changed between the A and the B. But that's the main, main difference is the, the length of the vehicle. One thing I want to point out to you guys, and this came about with the uh, the introduction of the A that I had a few people happen to. So on the, the E sprue here, the one that has the springs and stuff, if you notice on the top here, there are two slide molded machine guns. And I've had multiple people uh, that I know of that did not see them sitting there, thought it was just part of the sprue and discarded that before they had a chance to use them. So just warning you in advance, when you pull the kit out of the, the, the package, remember that you have your two machine guns on the top of the, the E sprue. So uh, just keep that in mind when you go forward. 
So now we can go ahead and start attaching the, the main parts and building suspension. So to start off with, we have four return rollers that'll get glued into place. We also need to put this, uh, it's not a poly cap, but it is a plastic cap inside there that you do not want to glue because it's going to glue the, the drive sprocket into it and the drive sprocket will still be able to spin. Then there'll be a little cap that goes over it here which I haven't sanded any of these parts yet. I'm just kind of showing you how they all go on there. And then also there's one big spring that'll go into place too that was on that e-sprue. But what I'm gonna do now is show you how the suspension arms go together. So the suspension arms are made up of two different parts and there's an A and B and on the vehicle, it's just a matter of what side A and B go on. So on one side of the vehicle, the A is on the outside. On the other side, the A is on the inside. And that way you'll get the, the mirrored effect for it. So there's a, an A and B part for the suspension. And you can see that it was a giant leaf spring. That Technically, this suspension kind of works a little bit because there is it is flexible in there. And then once you get the suspension glued together, which this side I have, and I started gluing that up, I'll show you how this will go together right after I show you the wheel. The wheel is molded as one piece like here. We do have to take a parting line out of the middle here, but you do need to glue on this, this little hub piece that goes on the outside. And there's one on the inside and the one on the outside of it. And they come on a flat piece like this, which you're gonna need some really good cutters to get up underneath like this. You come at an angle just like that and that removes it and then you'll be able to sand it really smooth and of course that rough sanded side put on the inside of the vehicle where you're not going to see that at all. So let's show you how the suspensions go together. You need to install the center hub which I already put a little bit of glue inside of both of these right here and kind of pop right in their shape real tight. Then, depending on the, the direction that the particular one is going to be, so this is one of the, the A sides out, you'll notice that it's got that little, my hand in front of there, that little edge compared to not, and that is going to be the part that goes inside the vehicle. So on this particular one, we want to make sure we line it up correctly, put that on the outside, line our wheels up in like that like that so it's all pinned together and this little bit of it's going to stick out here but there's going to be an outer edge that uh, metal bar that's going to hold it all together so you're going to have two of these and then you will have two of the, the ones going the other side so as you can see here, I've got all of those built up and then of course they will attach right in just like this now one other thing I should point out to you too this is a minor thing and most of you might know but when you're installing the uh, return rollers there is no hole on the other side on in there. So when you go to put glue inside there and push the piece on, it creates a little bit of like a, uh, like a shock absorber effect. So if you're not careful and you don't bleed the air out of you, you push it on, the piece will want to pop, uh, pop slightly out. And then what will happen is these will not be in a row anymore. So be careful. Every one of them did that. And you kind of just have to hold it there for a second. And then it'll, it'll fuse into shape there. But you don't want them popping out any wider. Because once they glue on there, you're going to have a hard time getting them off. And we've also gone ahead and put the spring on there. So I'm going to finish up the rest of the suspension arms. And then we'll go ahead and attach them into place. Okay, I've gone ahead and put both sides of the suspension arm on here. And you'll notice here too how the leaf springs point towards each other. And that is the correct way these uh, suspensions are supposed to be installed. That point and that point going to the outside. Now, we don't actually glue those into place. And it comes with this little tiny C-clip right here. And that's what fits on top of that little groove that I showed you earlier on in the build. Now, what I'll probably do is once we get everything all kind of assembled into place, I probably will go ahead and glue that. I don't know if this is going to be strong enough over time to hold it, but uh, it might be. But we want to keep the suspension loose right now while we're actually building all the lower part of the vehicle. What I thought I would do too, before I put actually glue those into place, I'd show you how the front suspension arm goes on. And there's this little bracket here, as well as the arm and we mount the arm into place without gluing it because we want this to be able to move slightly. It'll get glued into place just like that, just at the base. So this can actually ride up and down. Uh, and that's mainly just so when we're lining up the tracks and stuff we can. And you see it rests on top of this coil spring. There are a few other little armature pieces which 
this piece as well as this little piece in here that will connect those two together. And finally there is a, another road wheel that is completely different than the other one. It's the same size but uh, is shaped differently. And there's a little cap that we put inside here, kind of like a poly cap but it's actually made out of plastic. And we don't glue that in there. We put the cap on over that and then the wheel will be able to rest on top of that. So technically this outer road wheel will still spin. I don't know if that's necessary or not because I'm actually gluing all the other road wheels in place. Uh, it just makes it easier rather than, anytime you have any too much of working suspension and working road wheels and all that, you're more likely to break something. So let me go ahead and get all of these pieces sanded up, glued into place, and with all the suspension arms on, and I'll show you what one side of the suspension looks like. Now that all of the suspension parts are into place here, I did forget one little thing, and that is these bolt heads that go up on top of these, but not a problem. We can put them into place pretty easily just with gluing them. I've also gone ahead and just temporarily attached this piece here, and we've got all the suspension on, and we're just making sure that everything fits nice and flat. And with that being said, we're going to go ahead and glue all the suspension parts into place. I don't want any movement or anything. I, I like I said earlier, don't need any of that, but I want everything to lay nice and flat with all 10 wheels on the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and glue that, put all those little bolt heads on. As you can see right there, we've got about uh, about 20 of them, I guess we have to put on. So not a big deal. We'll get those taken care of right now. And also, since we've got the glue out anyway, we're going to go ahead and glue the front plate on here, the front of the hull into place. It fits pretty tight. We just want to put a little pressure on it to hold it into place there, make sure it dries perfectly straight. And this is how this rear portion of the tank is going to get built. This is for the uh, suspension for the uh, idler wheel in the back. And that two pieces are going to get glued together just like this. And then this whole piece gets attached up underneath here. And then we can finally put the arms for the idler on. And then finally, once we get it all glued together like we just did, slides right into place just like that. And I've also installed the uh, tow hitch as well. So now that we have all of the suspension built up on this, we need to start working on the tracks. And I'm going to show you the tracks on this kit here. They are all individual link track, so you have to build them all. And normally, if you watch this channel for any length of time, you know I kind of like go, oh, I don't want to build all those crazy tracks. But these, I actually enjoy quite a bit. And that is because if you look on the side here, these are all slide molded. So there is a hollow pin that goes all the way through. And they are very simple to put together. And even better, when they're done, they're completely workable and movable and are like I said, are not that bad at all to put together. I actually kind of enjoy these because they're going to be so much easier to paint and weather in detail, just like on the Panzer 1A that we built up. So that's how the tracks come on here. And then on a separate sprue, you're going to get the, the guide pins, or excuse me, the uh, track pins. And you can see they've got a top to them right there. Okay, I've zoomed in and move the camera so we can get it to the edge of the table here. And that is because these go together a lot, lot easier once you put them on the edge. So I've taken two track links and cut them and sanded them a little bit to get the little burr off. And on the edge of the table, we take our track pin and look, that, wow, okay. That was an extremely lucky one. About 60% of them go in that easy. The other 40, you have to slightly wiggle the track a little bit like I'm doing here. Then after you put the pin in, and usually you can do this after you've even completed a whole bunch of tracks, hit it just softly with a uh, sanding stick, and that'll take out the parting line on the, uh, the track pin. You also do have to keep in mind that you need to have the direction of each track, because each side is going to be slightly different, or is going to be going the other direction, because you want the track pins on the outside sticking out. So we've got this set that is pointing this direction. And then we have this complete set, which is pointing the other direction, which will be for this side of the vehicle. And let me just show you how this is going to work. So we have the, the arm for the idler back here, which we have not glued into place. And I'll explain to you why. Put the idler in place, the, uh, the drive sprocket on, drop the tracks into place, and then we can before we glue any of that stuff into place, there are 97 tracks 
on each side. So we'll pin together these last two. Now you can see they're, they're a little loose, but what we can do is once we pin this together, we can move the uh, tract tensioner out and we can get it to the tension that we want on these tracks after we've pinned them together. So you get an idea and then we can go ahead and glue everything straight down. I am not going to leave the tracks on because we want to paint the tracks separately. They're way easier to weather that way. But all it's going to be a matter of doing is just pulling the pin, taking the tracks off just like the real vehicle. And real fast, I temporarily pinned this track together. But I think this is about the amount of sag I want on these tracks. A little bit of sag here, a little bit here and here. And now we can go ahead and glue the suspension arms in. It took a little bit of time, but we have all of our tracks built up. You can see it's kind of cool that they fully work. I left the, the last link just pinned together with a staple on both sides, and that's just so we can pull them out later on. It's way easier than trying to pull out the pin. Staple just easy to grab there. Now, with that being done, we can go ahead and mount the glasses plate on the front of the vehicle here, and then followed up by the fenders, which I've attached the two little inner side points in there. And the way these are going to fit on here, the the bodies when they pull them out of the mold have a tendency to, to want to tightenly, tighten in a little bit on there. So it's a matter of just popping the inside and you can see how it just kind of like snaps into place just like that. And then of course we'll run glue down the entire side. So it's a very good fit. Then it'll follow by the upper plate here. And then finally we'll also be able to add the, uh, the engine area back here. Okay, what I thought I would do here is take a couple of seconds and show you how the uh, plate armor attaches to the upper part of the hull here. And kind of how you want to do it in, in steps. First one being this front plate that I've just glued into place. And that is because you want all of these other pieces to line up really, really flush. And this one you can see has a lot of wiggle room inside of it. So if you put the front plate on there first, this one will slide right up against it. We can glue that into place. Then there is a upper piece here that will lock all of these into place just like that. But the object is here that we don't have any gaps that we have to try to fill later on. And then once that gets done, I've also began to cut the fenders out. And those will get glued into place just like that. We're in the process of sanding those up, but uh, there's probably about 12 pieces that make up this upper hull, so you definitely want to be very careful making sure they all fit together just, just right without any seams inside. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and I'll come back once I'm done with that. And then we can actually, this is only been put into place here, but it's a very tight fit on this engine compartment. It really fits well, but we'll go ahead and glue it after we put this part of the upper hull on show you how quick and easy the turret goes together too. So this part will plug right in here. Those are the two machine gun barrels. There is one longer than the other and that is because of the way they are stacked inside the vehicle. So one is a little bit further forward than the other. And then once that gets put in, it will get placed right up front here, just like that. And then we glue the top of the turret on just like this. And then once those pieces are glued together, we can go ahead and glue these portions of the hinges down. There, there it goes. Just like that. And then finally there'll be a top hatch right in through here gone ahead and attached all of the the little parts here like the uh, the headlights uh, the light here in the middle the no tech the wiring for that this piece of piping that comes up out of the front of the vehicle is only temporarily put in place there it's actually not glued in yet because I think it has to be painted another color as we rotate around here uh, you can see I have the the muffler in place but I also have bent up the piece of photo etch including flaring those last little little pieces where the bolts go. I'm going to make those flat. And I just wrap these around a pen and then we'll just be able to go ahead and super glue that right into place just like that. Much, uh, much easier even than the other one. But now I want to talk to you guys about the explosive boom area here. Now it 
I've just glued these pieces up together because it's pretty pretty basic and simple. But one thing I do want to talk to you about is I didn't glue these last two together and that is because I think it's going to be a lot easier to A, first attach this to the vehicle just like this and then once that dries we can go ahead and attach this portion of it to it. And the reason I say that is because I think if we glue all of this together, we might get some weird angles because uh, it's not in a normal position for drying. Whereas this way we can just glue these first two bars together, then glue the, uh, these pieces right directly to the side of the tank. So I think that is what I'm going to do on this. Get this nice and secure into place and then glue the other part in there. So I'm going to go ahead and glue that on right now. So here is, at least assembly wise, uh, the completed model minus a few little accessories like some of the tools things like that which we'll put on after we paint the vehicle so I went over the entire thing cleaned up any sanding areas you know spaces like that that we need to do some finish sanding on especially after you put a coat of Mr. Surfacer 1000 which I absolutely love this stuff right here it does such a smooth finish right out of the can and it really lets you see any type of things that you need to um, you know fix on it sanding wise things like that so I'll go ahead and turn the turntable on so you can see a little 360 of the entire vehicle. I have to say I love these 16 scale vehicles. They are so detailed and simple to put together. And the best part of all is when we go to weather and paint this, it'll be even easier, I personally think there. So you can see the paint's drying a little bit back there. I sprayed one quick coat of Mr. Surfacer just before I started filming just to see if there was anything else we needed to fix. So now we can go ahead and pull the tracks off. And with the tracks taken off, we can go ahead and start painting the vehicle. We're going to start off with German gray as our base. And then we're going to use uh, a little touch of blue faded over the top to kind of like lighten some of the panels. Kind of like what we did with the Tamiya Panzer IV. Uh, it's been a while now. And then of course I've got all the tools here too that I will go ahead and paint and do all that stuff as well. So let's start painting. Okay, we've got some nice boring gray on there now. So now we're gonna add a little bit of uh, coloring and contrast. We're gonna use a little XF18 medium blue. I let the, uh, the two different coats of gray and then the medium blue dry. Went and sprayed the entire model with a little gloss coat put on our decals and used the Mark Fit Strong. This one wasn't really necessary to do the Mark Fit Strong, but the other side here had some bolt detail as well as a panel that we wanted to fill in. So I did put a, a lot of it on that. Uh, let it dry overnight after putting like two or three coats on there and then sprayed the entire model one more time with a, uh, with a gloss on there. And now we want to do some chipping and we're first going to use a uh, dark sea gray so basically it's a lighter color gray than what we're using as a base color and this is going to be the basis of our chips and it's just going to be the first part of the chips so we're going to use a really fine brush and i'm just going to start putting some real light chips right around some of the edges where you'd expect the paint to start to wear off now immediately you're probably going to say hey that's pretty light color right there but keep in mind this is just the first level of the chipping. As we go down, we will add some darker, some oxidized colors, which we will do in a few minutes. We also can try to put some scratches. Just some random things like that. And I'm using both hands because I want to try to keep it as fine as possible. It is definitely easier doing this on a 16 scale vehicle than 35th scale because you have a little bit more leeway with the chips. Mm -hmm. 
Now I am going to put a, a fair amount of weathering on this particular vehicle. How much you put on is completely up to you. Obviously if you want a lot, a little, uh, you know, or none at all actually. If you want a factory fresh, that is completely your, your way of building it. That is great. But I am going to put some rather large scratches and chips all over this vehicle. And what I'm going to do now, because this is going to take a little while, it's going to take a couple hours, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, I should say, uh, to go over and just to do all these little fine little chips all over areas that you'd have normal wear and tear on it. So I'll take a little bit of time to do that right now, and I'll come back and I'll show you what the next step is. Also, while we have this same color out, you're going to highlight any of the little nuts and bolts in this lighter color. Now that we've let that chipping gray dry, we are going to take a foam sponge torn into a triangle shape, dipped in our chipping color, which I'll show you right now up in the corner, and we're just going to blot it out on a paper towel. We don't want too much of it on there, and very lightly start tapping any of the areas that had the chipping gray on it. And that's why we want the triangle shape so we don't get too wide of a pattern. Just like that. And you can start going over all of the edges. Don't want to completely cover the gray. We want a little bit of that gray left behind. The gray left behind kind of represents the a scratch that rubs the paint but doesn't go all the way through and sometimes lightens the paint and gives the effect of different levels of scratches. And I want to just go over all of that. Now also some of the bigger scratches we're going to go back to taking our real fine brush again and we don't want to completely fill them in. We want to, actually you got to touch too much paint on there. We want to kind of randomly blot around To make it look like it's oxidation in the middle of each one of those little scratches. And you can kind of do a little bit with the brush and then a little bit with the sponge. And right now I know it looks kind of stark against the, uh, the colorings on it there. But once we start putting the washes on and we finish putting all of this, this chipping color on here, you'll really see how it starts to blend together and give the effect of a vehicle that has been... Uh, kind of beaten up a little bit there. And you can even run a few of the, the brown marks all the way down without the gray area. So go back and forth between the sponge and the brush. That way you get different random patterns of each one. Needless to say, this takes a little bit of time, so I'm going to go ahead and work on this for a little while. I also went ahead and painted the, uh, the road wheels black. Now that the brown is dry, we're going to do the same, same technique, this time with a little NATO black, just softly on there. And what that does is it kind of tones down the brightness of the brown chipping effect. And it also makes some areas that are even a slightly little bit more worn. So like in some of the corners you can do a little extra blotting. And you'll see how it starts to blend it together and make it make it look more like older, older scratches. Let's see if I can get it up above here. And then of course once it dries. Next up, we're going to do a little staining of the paint. And I'll show you what I mean by that. You can kind of see that I've already done a little bit right there. And here I'm just taking some Tamiya's black panel liner, just blotting a little bit on, and then just taking a foam brush, just lightly blot most of it out. And it'll create random effects of, of staining, basically, on it. And when it dries, it dries very, very subtle. But it, it breaks up the, uh, the 
you know, the evenness of the paint. I mean, this vehicle is supposed to look like it's been around for a little while, so there's going to be more discolorations in the paint, uh, grease stains, grime, things like that. So don't go too, too crazy on that because, I mean, you can obviously overdo it very quickly, but especially all of these flat surfaces, it's very, very nice to kind of break up that monotony there. Now that the brown is dry, we're going to do the same, same technique, this time with a little NATO black, just softly on there. And what that does is it kind of tones down the brightness of the brown chipping effect. And it'll also make some areas that are even a slightly little bit more worn. So like in some of the corners, you can do a little extra blotting. And you'll see how it starts to blend it together and make it make it look more like older older scratches if I get it up above here and then of course once it dries Okay, now we're going to work on dirtying up the tracks and lower suspension. Now you can see on this side of the vehicle, I've gone ahead and already done that. So we're going to flip it around to the other side and show you how we did it. First up is a little Ammo by Meg Splash Mud mixed with some pigment. And we're just going to blot it with a very old brush. brush. Now we're going to do the same thing with a little bit lighter version of the splash mud and a little lighter pigment. On this one I'm using a little light sienna as the pigment base. We still want to leave some areas of gray paints showing too so not completely packed with mud. And you can see how the pigment adds some little extra chunkiness to it. Okay, we've put the tools on now, and now I'm just taking a little mix of pigment powder, in this case light sienna, and mixing it with a little brown panel liner from Tamiya, and just trying to make some little, you know, light dirt deposits in some of the areas. Not too heavy, and but just doing a mixture of the two creates these nice light brown, dark brown type little things. And then, of course, like I said, I've got all of the tools on, but we'll show you all that in the final reveal. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a little bit more dirt and dust effect over the vehicle, and then we will show you what it looks like when it's all done. And here is the completed model. 
Now, I do have to say, I did go over it uh, a little bit more with a little panel liner here, a little bit of weathering uh, pastel pigment here and there, and then took some enamel thinner in areas where I thought the mud was too thick or you know something else was a little too heavy, went and removed some of it from certain areas. And I'm sure you guys do the same thing. You look at your model and you go, eh, it's a little bit overdone in that area, a little too light in this area. So basically, did the same thing. All the techniques are the same. We just did it over and over again. Now what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and turn the turntable on so you guys can get a 360 view of this kit. Uh, love doing the 16th scale. Detailing and weathering, uh, is literally twice as much fun as doing on a 35th scale. I like it that much. Oh, there's the the explosive charge part in the back there. And it's good now to have one in my my Panzer Gray as well as the uh, the Desert Yellow that we did on the A version a while back. I also think the tools came out pretty good. Um, I've got a video on how to do the tools very, very simply and easily just with the brown panel liner and some to me, uh, XF59, Desert Yellow. Very, very simple, and I think it adds a nice effect to it there. Give you a little overhead view, too. Take a closer look at the uh, the wood grain on the tools. And um, love building this kit. It was great to put together. It fits together really well. I love 16 scale just because of the size of it. And and this is not crazy big either, too. I mean, you know, like a Tiger would be in 16 scale. Panzer One's pretty easy to display and not take up a ton of room. This boom off the back here does add, you know, another six, seven inches total to the vehicle, but uh, it looks pretty cool on there. I don't know if they actually ever use those or if it was just a test thing, but is a very, very cool thing. So this kit is available. Uh, you can build it with or without the boom. In fact, we have them on our website, andyshhq.com, if you want to take a look at those. Uh, definitely would recommend the Tacom Panzer ones in 16 scale. Any of the, the four different ones that they have out, all fabulous, fabulous kits. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you guys as always for watching. And please stay tuned because we have many more videos coming.